Hello, everyone. Welcome to topic 3.7. This is going to discuss the first government of the United States under the Articles of Confederation. So through this, we want to be able to explain how different forms of government, excuse me, different forms of government developed and changed as a result of the revolutionary period. And this first one um, is really very much a test run that we're going to have to go back to the drawing board for. And I think that's sometimes why students struggle with the Articles of Confederation is because it's something that's no longer around today. However, we do learn some very distinct and important lessons about government and representative government and federalism that help us get it right with the Constitution. So to start us off, we're going to look at the organization of new state governments that occur after the American Revolution. Once the American Revolution concludes and the Treaty of Paris is signed, the colonists realize that they are going to need some form of government to be able to survive and to be able to function as a newly independent nation. At this point in the history of the United States and in the history of our class, we have 13 very different colonies that have a mutual distrust in tyrannical rule. And this is going to lead to a weak government under the Articles of Confederation which will act as the first government of the United States. So what that really means is we have these 13 very distinct states that are really just different from one another. They do not necessarily agree on everything. They have different economies, climates, geography, principles, religions, all of that stuff. It's kind of like a ragtag group of people, okay? Um, <clears throat> but that one thing that they do have in common is they distrust having one absolute ruler and one ruler that is going to take all of the power for themselves. So when they write the Articles of Confederation, they want to make sure that you're not going to have a president or a king or a dictator or one ruler that's going to have too much power that might oppress the people, just like King George III in British Parliament oppressed the colonists that were living here in North America before the war. So one of the things that um, kind of comes up in an idea that's put to, put to the test is that each state constitution, because they are going to kind of build 13 different state constitutions at this time, each of these state constitutions is going to begin with a bill or a declaration listing basic rights and freedoms, okay? That should sound kind of familiar to what our Bill of Rights is today. A lot of these, they included things like a right to a jury, a right to a trial, okay? Um, um, right to practice whatever religion you might choose or religious freedom. Basic rights that they felt like the state government should not be able to take away from the people. Um, those rights are going to belong to all. And again, state officials are not allowed to infringe on them, just like in today's government, um, federal government officials cannot infringe on your civil liberties that are outlined in the Bill of Rights, but more on that later. They are going to have a separation of powers in each of these state constitutions. They do have three branches of government in every single state in the United States, but it is separate in all of the different states' constitutions. So you're going to have a legislative branch that is going to have, um, that is going to elect two, sorry, is going to elect a two house legislator. You're going to have an executive branch um, that is going to be the governor essentially, which will be elected by the people. And then you're going to have a judicial branch, okay? The judicial branch is going to create a court system for that particular state. And there are going to be checks and balances between all of those three different branches, executive, legislative, and judicial, to protect against tyranny, meaning that the legislative branch is going to have certain powers to check the executive branch, but the executive branch will have some powers to check the legislative, and so on and so forth, okay? Voting. All white males with land, um, who owned land, could vote in any individual state. Certain other states, though, like we saw in our assignment in class, they might drop the property qualification for being able to vote. Um, certain states might have other different voting parameters, but generally speaking, in all 13 states, if you are a white male who owns land, you will be able to vote or hold public office. Same um, with office holding. This, though, you're going to need pretty much a property qualification for, okay? Although you can vote without owning property or having wealth. Um, you might not necessarily be able to hold office, okay? Um, that's something that is pretty common throughout all 13 state constitutions at this time. All right, so the Articles of Confederation themselves. So I just spoke about the state governments, okay, and how the state governments operate, what the jobs of the different branches are, et cetera. That's not necessarily something that's taken into consideration at the federal level, okay? 
Dickinson, when he is writing the Articles of Confederation, he wanted to protect individual states when it came to the Articles, and he was going to be the one who obviously drafts them, okay? He also is looking out for the rights of the individual. He doesn't think that the federal government should have too much power. He doesn't think that it should have too much power over the states, and he doesn't think that the federal government should be able to limit individual citizens' civil liberties. For ratification, so to add an article to the Articles of Confederation, you needed approval. <clears throat> um, sorry, approval of all of the articles were delayed because of claims to land in the Alleghenies that American Indians had at this time. So they were kind of going over a dispute and a land dispute with Native Americans at this point. They were trying to get a vote to pass the Articles of Confederation, and that got delayed. That's honestly not 100% important, but I just throw that note in there. Okay, the structure of the government itself the central government or the federal government is going to have a one house legislator, okay? So it's just one body of people, kind of almost like the House of Burgesses. It's just one representative assembly that will have representatives from each of the 13 states. So you will have a representative from Virginia, you'll have a representative from New Jersey, you'll have a representative from New York. Everybody has one, okay? They have equal representation. Um, in order to add an article to the Articles of Confederation, nine out of the 13 people sitting on the legislator would need to approve that article to pass that law or to pass that article or ratify it, okay? So every single time something is proposed in the federal government, nine out of the 13 have to approve, which is kind of difficult. That is a pretty good majority. And as we know from our own Congress today, um, people in the legislative body do not always agree that starkly on everything. There isn't going to be an executive or judicial branch under the Articles of Confederation. So the closest thing that they have to a president during the years of the Articles is going to be like the president of Congress itself. OK, so there's no real president, vice president. There's not a cabinet, anything like that. There is also no judicial branch, OK, meaning that there is no Supreme Court. There is no federal court system. That is not something that exists at this time. And if they were to amend one of the original articles, okay, you would actually need a unanimous vote from that entire legislative body to be able to amend it, which is really difficult to get all 13 representatives from these 13 very different states to agree on something, okay? Um, again, if we think about our own Congress today and our legislators, they do not agree on much because of party differences. Um, we could see how this might be an issue back then as well. Some of the powers, okay? Congress can do things, um, and the Congress under the articles can do things like wage war, okay? They get to make decisions in if we, for, if we go to war with a foreign nation, okay? They can make treaties with foreign nations, and they can send diplomatic representatives. So they get to do anything that has to deal with foreign affairs, essentially, okay? They also are able to borrow money from outside nations as well. Um, one thing that they cannot do, or actually a few things that they cannot do, they can't regulate commerce or collect taxes for the states. So if um, we had two companies, let's say there's a company in New York trading with a company from New Jersey, if they are entering a trade dispute where they can't get along, the federal government under the Articles of Confederation can't come in and state any rules or laws. Okay, that's just going to have to be disputed between the states, which runs into some problems. Okay. In addition to that, the federal government, because the founders and the framers of the Articles of Confederation, because they were so still scarred, I guess, from the American Revolution and the excessive taxation that the British imposed on the colonists, um, they made it so that the federal government was not able to collect taxes from the states either, which, again, is problematic because if the federal government can't collect taxes, they can't pay back their debts. They can't build roads, bridges, other infrastructure. They can't pay a military. Um, they're not able to come up with these funds that they need to run a government smoothly or run a country smoothly. And again, if the states were going to have to decide on a federal tax that was going to be imposed, every single state had to vote on all taxes. And again, that puts a lot of barriers into place to be able to generate revenue. So again, these are just some key issues that we see pretty early on that are happening. So the United States under the Articles of Confederation, okay, the government was supposed to be weak, all right, that was the idea. 
And ironically, that actually turns out to be the problem for all of the reasons that I stated on the last slide, right? It's really difficult to function with some of these parameters put into place and it's hard to function effectively. However, there are going to be some accomplishments under the Articles of Confederation. The first is independence, okay? The United States government under the Articles of Confederation, they did negotiate peace with England, okay? And they declared their independence formally through the Treaty of Paris. So that's the first important thing. And the second thing that the government was able to do under the Articles of Confederation is they passed the Land Ordinance of 1785. This is a policy basically <clears throat> for surveying and selling Western land, okay? So all of the land in like the um, land ordinances in the Northwest Territory, that's kind of like some of the states on this map here, what the land ordinance of 1785 does is they can survey, so explore the land, see what's out there. They can sell it to other Americans to start settling a little bit further west. And it's also going to fund public education in those areas, which will be beneficial to the Americans who move there. Nor the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, that's going to be the territory between the Great Lakes and the Ohio River and it's going to have policies of becoming states. So it essentially is going to outline parameters for statehood that your state or your territory needs to hit a certain population requirement. You would have to draft a constitution, it would have to be approved by Congress, and then that territory could file for statehood and become a state. Um, there is going to be limited self-government in a lot of these new territories <clears throat> because they're not quite states yet. And slavery is going to be prohibited in these states that are a part of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, okay? So Ohio will never have the opportunity to have slavery. Indiana, Illinois, et cetera, et cetera. They will always be free states, essentially. Um, there are gonna be schools out there that are funded by some of the land ordinance of 1785. There is a lack of slavery, and that makes the land attractive to both white and free Black settlers. So we see that some of these populations will be relatively diverse. However, the wealthy are going to have first dibs here because they have the money to be able to afford the land. Basically, if you have the money to purchase land out west, you're going to, going to be able to do it and you're going to be able to go there. If you don't have money to purchase land out west, you're probably not going to have the means to be able to settle in those regions. So again, some of the weaknesses with the article. So for all of the things that I described two slides ago, <clears throat> the following are going to happen as a result. In terms of foreign affairs, the US is going to have really not a ton of respect from Europe because it couldn't pay back its debts or act in crisis, okay? They're not able to generate taxes to pay back the debt that they still have with Britain, okay? Or any other nation like France for that matter. Britain is still maintaining military outposts on the Western frontier too. They still have forts out in the Ohio Valley and we're a little bit upset that they're still hanging out in our country. Um, they were not necessarily restoring property to the loyalists either as was promised in the Treaty of Paris. And they haven't again paid back their debts to foreigners that helped them during the war. Britain and Spain, they start kind of getting <clears throat> annoyed with this that they aren't getting their debts paid back and they wanted to act and expand. And what they were starting to think of doing is maybe start encroaching on and infringing on American territory because they knew we were a very weak nation with a weak government and they could take back that land pretty quickly. Economic problems. Congress had no taxing power again at this time, okay? They were mainly kind of asking for donations to be able to fund the government from each state. From each state. And so states did have, have a ton of unpaid debts themselves, okay? Like the state government of like Georgia, let's say, they may owe money still to the British government or wealthy people over back in Britain. So what winds up happening, there is going to be limited credit and trade that results from this. We are going to be locked out of trade contracts with other nations. Um, we're not going to be getting money <clears throat> to fund things from other nations like we had been getting it in the past because we're not essentially trustworthy, okay? Um, nations don't trust us to be able to pay that money back. And what starts happening is many of these different states, because the states have the power to print money at this time, they just start printing a bunch of worthless paper money causing inflation, which is going to lead to an economic depression under the Articles of Confederation as well. There are going to be a number of internal conflicts too. We really have essentially 13 state rivalries. Everybody thinks they're the best at this time. 
We're going to see tariffs put into place to try and bolster an American economy, which are kind of falter at this time. Um, and there's tariffs that are put on in between states, too. Like if you lived in New York, there might be a tariff put into place from goods from like Georgia, let's say. So they even kind of rivaled each other in trade, which gets tricky. Um, and they had restrictions on each other. There are also going to be boundary disputes. Like if you were on the border of like, let's say like New York and Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania might think that they have more land than they actually do. New York might think that they can bleed into Pennsylvania territory. And the federal government can't really make a call on that. They don't have enough power to be like the, the middleman essentially. So the national government really can't stop much of this conflict that's happening between these 13 individual states. Shays Rebellion is where this all kind of comes to a head. So Shays Rebellion happens in 1786. And I would say that this event is important for a couple of reasons. It's going to show American Americans the true weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. It's going to force them to draft a stronger government under the Constitution. And we are going to compare Shays Rebellion to a later rebellion called the Whiskey Rebellion in a different topic. So this does come back up again. So Shays Rebellion is where Captain Daniel Shays, who is a farmer and a Revolutionary War veteran, he is going to lead other Massachusetts farmers in an uprising. And they are uprising against the high state taxes that are put into place at this time. They are rebelling because they are constantly being imprisoned for debt because they cannot pay those taxes or they cannot pay money back to people with power or the state government. And they also don't have enough paper money in Massachusetts at this time either. The economy is essentially completely eroded and the state government of Massachusetts is taking it out on the people and these poor farmers rather than coming up with solutions to these problems. So what winds up happening, they're going to stop the, the um, collection of taxes and they are going to force a close of debtors courts. This is what the rebellion does, okay? They are also going to march to the Springfield army and seize weapons from the federal arsenal, and they're going to try to until the state militia stops them. So this is a pretty radical rebellion. It disrupts the government. Many people are harmed along the way. They try to steal <clears throat> um, weapons from the state militia, which could be potentially dangerous. And this really shows that like, the federal government under the Articles of Confederation cannot get a handle on this new country, and things need to change. Okay, so that is your information for 3.7. For 3.8, we are going to talk about how Americans are going to fix the problems of the Articles of Confederation uh, through the Constitutional Convention. So you can go ahead and read that chapter in EMSCO and then come back here to watch the video.